In the middle of the, um, the 70s, um, I met a man named Bob who, um, without knowing it, changed my life. Bob had everything going for him. He, um, you know, he had a wife and kids and houses and, and cars and various businesses. Kind of, you know, he was living a good life, the American dream. And <clears throat> when I um, met him, all of that had fallen away. Um, he was wheelchair bound, alone, uh, and in the final stages of multiple sclerosis. So he had lost everything. And um, at this point, kind of like adding insult to injury, I guess, he was also imprisoned in a body that he uh, could no longer use. And you know, there was a, in, in listening to Bob tell his story, um, a question arose from inside of me from, from just a very deep place. And the, and the question, was this, and I didn't ask him this question, it was a question within me, and the question was, how does this man define himself? And you know, I have to tell you that even though that was a long time ago, that question has haunted me ever since. I think it, uh, frankly, is one of the most fundamental questions um, of human existence. For the past 10 years, I've had um, this incredible opportunity, actually a privilege, um, to spend one night a week with a group of men um, who I would consider some of the most advanced, um, essence-filled people I've ever met. Every night, each one of those men is locked in a cage. Um, most of them are serving a sentence of life without parole. Many of them have done 25, 30 years in prison. And what inspires me uh, is that <clears throat> I've, I've come to know the men well enough to, to know that they dig down deep into themselves and have done so for a long time. Um, to, in a sense, uh, you know, rediscover dimensions of themselves, it, it, actually to make themselves free in a place that, for all intents and purposes, um, does quite the opposite. And what I've learned from this is that every one of us has um, abilities and uh, capacities that are beyond our imagination. So what I'd like to talk um, with, with you about um, tonight is uh, a number of things that are kind of all interwoven. I want to talk about uh, essence and walls and circles and rage and passion uh, and, and reinventing ourselves as we go about reinventing the world. And I want to tell you a, um, a short version of a long story, so you're lucky in that regard. Because <laughs> trust me, this story could take hours. Uh, in 1985, I um, set foot in prison for the first time, luckily by my own volition, by the way. And you know, I'll never forget that first day. It, it's as if it were like yesterday. The sights, the sounds, the smells, it was kind of a, a, a sensory overload of stale sweat and, and old sneakers and uh, uh, clanging uh, bars, uh, crumbling cement, um, and of course the deafening uh, you know, announcements on the PA system that were constant. And men, hundreds of men who seemed to be locked in some kind of bizarre uh, dance, uh, uh, in a sense what I think of as a listless fugue arrested in time. 
And that was the sense that I got that day, that, that underneath the, the noise and the chaos that was everywhere, there was actually silence and inertia. And a sense of, um, of alienation that was beyond what I could even imagine. It was very disturbing to me. So much of what I saw that day was deeply disturbing to me. Um, and for that reason, this may sound odd, but for that reason I had to go back. And I had to keep going back, uh, which I did, several times a week for many years. And I continue to, by the way. And part of it is because I wanted to understand what this was. What we were doing, what we as a society were doing um, in this thing that we call incarceration, what, what we were doing, what we are doing in the name of justice. And I wanted to know uh, how this was related to our social psyche. And so I just kept going in. And I'll tell you, uh, you know, during that time, there was, I started to get this sense of, of rage that was building inside of me. And the rage was really at the, the, the many uh, systems and, and uh, social inequalities uh, that exist that, in a sense, come to roost in the prison system. That's where a lot of this leads. And I'm not talking about the people there. I'm talking about um, that, you know, that we have this, that we, uh, you know, the, the um, I guess you could say the freest, most resource-filled country in the world, that we incarcerate more people than any other country. 2.3 million people or more. It's tragic. And the, that, that anger just kept building. You know, I met thousands of men and women inside. Thousands. And, you know, in many ways, those folks were no different from me. Maybe by dint of birth, um, I may well have been there as well. So, this rage is floating around inside of me, and you know, that doesn't go anywhere good, right? So what I, um, this very strange thing happened. Out of the blue, I got this opportunity to teach, to teach some courses in corrections at, at Temple University. And um, as I started to teach these courses, of course, what I needed to do um, was to bring my students into prisons and jails in the area. I wanted their lives to be shaken as mine was because it had such an incredible effect on me. I mean, not just the rage, also other things. And sure enough, you know, I, I watched. I mean, I've taken more easily more than 10,000 students uh, behind the walls, gotten everyone out so far, by the way. <laughs> of course, there always is a first time. I, I tell students that too. No, but I, I've taken a lot of people there, and I watch as they come out, and, and often, most times, I see reflected on their faces the same sort of thing that I felt that first day when I went in. So I was doing this, you know, over several years. Uh, every class I had, I would take students in, and then something really, um, really quite out of the ordinary happened uh, in 1995. It's one of these moments um, that changes your life, but you kind of don't know it at, at that point, but it gets revealed later. So here's what happened. I took a group of 15 students to a state prison about three hours away from here, a prison called Dallas. Obviously not Dallas, Texas. And, <clears throat> you know, I figured it would be like the other trips that, that we've taken. and so. You know, uh, we went there, we toured the facility, and then we got this opportunity to sit down and talk with um, a panel of, of men serving life. And I'll tell you that 
Up to that point, I had never had this powerful a discussion any place, in a prison, uh, in a classroom, pretty much anywhere. We talked about crime and justice and race and class and politics and economics and how it was all interwoven. It went deep really fast. And you know, it was the, I don't know if you've ever had this experience where you lose track of time. It seemed like we had been there for hours talking. It was maybe 45 minutes. And we had to end because we had a long drive back. So, you know, as we finished, we're walking out of the room. One of the men from the panel, a gentleman named Paul, came up to me. I had never met this guy before. And he said, um, have you ever thought about doing this over a whole semester? I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, you know, you could bring the students here. And I'm thinking three hours away. I don't think so, you know. And, and he said, you know, bring the students here. We could read books together. We could write papers and, you know, and have these kinds of conversations like a class on a weekly basis. I said, well, no. I mean, I've never thought of that. That's a fabulous idea. And I said, now, I have to be honest. This is really too far. But I promise you, I promise you that I will think about it. And as you can imagine, I could do nothing but think about it. It was too compelling an idea. So I started to put uh, some thoughts down on paper. I created a, a, a syllabus. And I thought about you know, how, um, you know, how this class would go, what the kind of uh, teaching approach would be. So I came up with all that. I came up with the name, the Inside Out Prison Exchange Program. Uh, exploring issues of crime and justice behind the walls. I mean, that's a little descriptive, you know, statement. And I had no place to do it. And, you know, I could tell you lots of ins and outs of this story, but basically, that's appropriate, ins and outs, right? Um, but, but actually, it's too much to get into. But I'll just tell you this, that I had to wait for a little while, a couple false starts. I ended up um, beginning it in the Philadelphia jail system. And so I approached them, and uh, I said to this contact that I had there, said, you know, I, I just described what, what I had in mind, and um, I said, now this is a pilot. I have no idea if this would work. And of course, secretly, I'm thinking, if it works, I'll take credit. If not, I'll blame that guy, Paul. <laughs> and you know, I'm here to tell you that it was way beyond what I could ever have imagined. Powerful, powerful stuff. The, what happened in that classroom just was like nothing I had ever seen. And so I just kept doing it. I did it every semester for you know, quite a while. So that was in 1997. Uh, and during the way, along the way, um, two Temple uh, professors came to me. They had some ideas for classes that they wanted to do in the prison, and so I helped them to get started. And frankly, really, honestly, that was all I ever envisioned. I so loved doing this that you know, I didn't see anything bigger than that. And so 2002 rolled around, and um, I got the approval to expand the program to Greaterford Prison. Greaterford is a very large maximum security prison about an hour outside of Philadelphia. And in the process of setting up um, this class at Greaterford, I got a letter from a guy who was incarcerated there. And so I'm looking at this letter. And I looked at the name, and I thought, I don't know who this is. And you know, I mean, I, it's not like I didn't get letters from people. So I started to read it, and it said, you know, <clears throat> we're really excited um, about you starting this program here. Um, um, you know, we're very, you know, we're we're really looking forward to it. I'm going to be helping to get it started. Um, I'm part of the Lifers Association, and they were kind of helping us to to get it started there. And he said, I'm serving life, as a matter of fact. And you know, he said a few other things, and then this was the kind of jaw-dropping moment for me. He said, by the way, you may remember me. I met you at Dallas. My name is Paul. So here the guy with the original idea, who knew, had been transferred to Greaterford, and he was going to help to get it started at Greaterford. I mean, I thought it was just a beautifully full circle experience. And, um, and indeed, he not only 
got to start at Greaterford, but everything else that has happened since he's been involved with. So we had this first class at Greaterford, and it was a, an over-the-top experience. And um, I'm, I, ju I just realized that I need to step back and say and, and explain some things to you. Um, I'll get back, remind me. Greater fruit is where I need to pick up. Because what I want to do is I want to describe what happens in this class. It's very important uh, for you to be able to appreciate it. So picture um, 15 university students going into a prison or a jail and meeting with 15 uh, people who are incarcerated there, either men or women. And together, studying issues for the entire semester. Now, to be clear, what we're not doing is, as outside people, we're not going in to study the folks on the inside. We're not going in to help them. Nobody asks us for help. Uh, we're not advocating for them in any way. And, and we're also not developing relationships that exceed the boundaries of that classroom. It is really learning together. It's really studying together. And so, uh, and I, I, well, I talk with my hands because I'm Italian, but also I tend to do this a lot because we use circles in Inside Out all the time. And so when, you know, to, I want you to picture this classroom, and usually it's a fairly small room, with a large circle in it, and alternately it's inside student, outside student, inside, outside, inside, outside, sitting alternately around the circle. And what happens in that circle is in so, sometimes it's nothing short of magical. I mean, it's based on dialogue. Um, as, as the instructor, um, I move out of the picture as much as possible, and I facilitate, and all of our instructors do this, I facilitate an ongoing dialogue for the semester in the large group as well as in uh, smaller subgroups that uh, kind of work more deeply or get more deeply into some aspect of whatever the topic is that given week. <clears throat> and, there, and when we are in that circle, and this is really key, everybody is equal. Everybody has an equal voice. Everybody has an equal stake, whether you're wearing a uniform or not. And that's part of the power of this. And there's something about the circle as well that, you know, for people who have been sliced off from the community through incarceration, and, you know, we're not going to talk about whether people deserve it or not. That's, that is not part of this conversation today. I mean, I know that's very complex. Um, but the reality is that there are people who are cut off from the community. And what this circle represents is an opportunity to bring people back into community. And the power of that is hard to describe. Um, one, of, one of the other things that I want to say is this. You know, when I first started this, I was really uh, kind of focused on <clears throat> learning what we could learn together about crime and justice. What I didn't expect was the other learning that was happening. And I saw it unfold before my eyes. It was beautiful. I mean, people were learning about themselves, about other people, about communication, about conflict, because conflict you know, often would emerge in the class. Everybody doesn't agree with everybody else, and that's, that's, that's a great teachable moment. Um, people would learn about um, society in a different way and their relationship to society. I mean, I never anticipated this. Those kinds of levels of learning that were happening, it was, it was pretty stunning, um, which is why I needed to do it. So that gives you at least a little bit of a, um, a feel for what this is. So back to um, kind of the, the mini history. Um, so. We had this class at Greaterford, amazing class, so amazing that the group decided to stay together and to work on things, to stay together programmatically, and to work on some projects that had to do with um, what we called re-educating the public about crime and justice. Because 
what came clear through our conversations in, in, throughout the semester is that there is a lot of misinformation and misunderstanding about crime and the administration of justice in our society. And so we began to meet. We started meeting in October of 2002. And I'll tell you that we started to meet every Wednesday night. We still meet every Wednesday night. It's almost 10 years now. It's pretty astonishing. And we've done all kinds of things over that time. But one of the first things that we did, uh, which is, is very significant, is we decided as a group that this was too good an idea just to keep at one university, that we needed to do more with it. And so somebody in the group said, I think this was kind of funny actually, let's make it into a national program. And I said, sure, <laughs> how do we do that? And so what we did was I was able to get a fellowship that supported um, paying some people to, um, to help us to pull together all that was necessary. And we worked for a solid year, people on the outside, people on the inside working collaboratively to bring together the pieces that were necessary. And in uh, July of 2004, we had our very first training. We were afraid that nobody would come because it was too weird an idea. Uh, we were hoping for maybe 10 to 12 people. We got 20 people in the first training from all over the country. And I'll tell you, this is not an easy training. This is a seven day, 60 hour, uh, yeah, 60 hour intensive training. So if you do the math, you don't sleep much during this training. <laughs> that's not in the plan. I mean, you know, it's just that's the way it goes. Um, to, to fast forward to today, because there's some other things I want to say. I don't want to stick with just the history. We have had 22 trainings at this point. We, uh, there are 310 inside out instructors, college professors throughout the country in 37 states and in Canada and a couple of other countries. Um, I mean, this thing has really taken off. And it, is, it astonishes me probably more than anybody else because it started as, at the, as this tiny little chance idea that Paul just said that day. And, you know, it's like sowing a seed and if, if the ground's fertile, something happens. And it was. And, uh, and so here we are with this you know, kind of uh, monstrous program that is, is growing uh, more and more all the time. And you know, uh, part of what I, I think about, I've been listening today uh, you know, and, and thinking about leadership. And I think leadership is lots of things, but one of the things that I have come to learn a lot about through this program is, <clears throat> Uh, is about growth and how really wonderful growth happens and that by its nature, growth is organic. And that's really how this program has grown in an organic way. And what I mean by that is that it is influenced by the people who get involved in it. And, and trust me, some very interesting people from all over the country, instructors, inside students, outside students have, have you know, um, uh, brought their own unique uh, ideas, their own creativity to this. And so in a sense, what I think of as, um, as really good leadership, the one dimension of it at least, is actually the same thing that good teaching is. It's about drawing forth. You know, um, the, the root of the word education doesn't mean to stuff in, like stuffing in information. It means to draw forth. That is what the root of the word means. And I think of that in terms of education as well as leadership. That, you know, what we do, yes, we do these trainings. We invite people to become part of this uh, network. We're really community that now is beyond the borders of, of this country. And not just to be part of it, uh, in a nominal way, but to be engaged in it. And I think that the reason why this thing has taken off, one of the reasons is that people bring their creative energy to it and they have a place to put that energy. And 
they have a sense of passion about this work. Uh, it's not really work, you know, per se, um, but uh, about what, what it is that we're doing. You know, and I, I, just to tell you a little bit more about uh, where this has gone, um, we, uh, we've offered throughout the country and, and in Canada easily more than 300 inside out classes at this point involving, oh, about 10,000 students. And the disciplines, and this is part of the, this organic thing I was talking about, the disciplines are interesting because we started by kind of focusing on people who were in the area of crime and justice. Very quickly, it started to kind of leak out into other areas to the point where now we have people teaching classes in, you know, disciplines like economics, theater, uh, sociology, uh, the humanities, yoga, <laughs> etc. I mean, the stuff that we would never have anticipated. Literally, we have classes that are offered across the social sciences and across the arts and humanities. And again, it's not something, you know, we didn't plan that. We didn't, uh, we didn't anticipate that that would happen. We, didn't, we couldn't have predicted it. Um, but it's just the right thing. And I think that one of the reasons why this has taken off as it is, as it has, excuse me, <clears throat> it, there's a couple of reasons. One is that it's, um, in my mind, it's a kind of cutting edge approach to education uh, for, for a number of reasons, but one of which is this. You know, part of what we think about in terms of education is we think of it as an eyebrows up enterprise. <laughs> And um, I mean, that's how so much of our education is kind of um, dished out to us, which is really unfortunate. And of course, as people talking at us, like I'm talking at you, right? Um, and I apologize for that because I never do this. I don't believe in, in, in this. I believe in you know, uh, the power of dialogue. However, when you think about eyebrows up, what I think about is, you know, we don't live from the eyebrows up, so why do we think we would best learn from the eyebrows up? And so, you know, this is doing something very different. It's a whole, uh, the person has to bring their whole body into this, their whole person. And, you know, it seems to me that um, education uh, that deserves the name education uh, really needs to be a full person experience as much as possible. I think that one of the other reasons uh, why this is uh, so has become uh, just as grown as it has is that um, uh, I've just gotten distracted, I'm sorry. Um, one of the other reasons is um, that it's a very compelling thing uh, to go in this class, this class inside a prison. Um, I'll tell you what I got distracted by. I can't believe that I just talked for so long and I'm over time if I'm reading this correctly. So I'm gonna have to really wrap this up. Um, Anyway, let me just say a couple of quick things and, and then I'll be done. The, uh, the kind of ironic twist of creating a space, a space of freedom in a place that is quite the opposite of that is, is uh, something that's pretty amazing. And when I say a, a place of freedom, what I mean is that there are people um, you know, in that space who, you know, the, the idea is that you can be yourself, you can speak uh, and, and say what you need to say, and the people invite the best out of one another, the best ideas, the best critical thinking, the best really of what it means to, to be a human being. And that's what happens in there. Um, so I, I, I want to wrap up uh, with, with this thought uh, for you. One of the things and the reason that it says what it says here, moving beyond the walls that separate us, I think that 
most fundamentally, inside out, I mean, when you, when you really get down you know, um, to the kind of deeper areas, um, inside out is about walls. You know, and we, we, uh, we build walls between us, um, around us, sometimes within us, out of fear. And one of the things that happens is when an exchange can happen, that does something to the fear, that mitigates the fear. Um, and so my hope is that through these ongoing exchanges, um, that the, the walls that are you know, between us, around us, within us, uh, will gradually um, kind of fade away and, um, and become more permeable so that eventually they'll become extinct. One idea, one person, one brick at a time. All of our lives depend on that. Thank you.